Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel session today, where we will be discussing making financial services work for women. And we'll have lessons from founders and investors. Um, my name is Fatima Tambajang, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I work with a company called NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is the engine as artificial intelligence as we know it today, um, when it comes to chat GPT and so forth. Um, today's session is super important as according to the World Bank, over 34% of women in Africa are entrepreneurs. And despite that, access to funding and support remains a challenge. So we'll speak to a few founders and we'll also speak to investors and get their thoughts on it and their experiences and so forth. So we'll just go into introductions and I will start with Jihan and then she can pass the mic and then we can take it from there. So over to you, Jihan. Uh, thank you so much, Fatima. Hi, everyone. My name is Jihan Abbas. I'm the uh, founder and CEO at Lamy. Um, Lamy is an insure tech based out of Kenya. Our goal is to democratize access to insurance products by digitizing the value chain and creating that level of accessibility that's been missing for a long time across uh, the continent. Um, I'm originally from Kenya. So, um, you know, for me, it was also something very important to be able to actually break the very low insurance penetration barrier across Africa um, you know, and, and targeting um, the insurance space, which has been ignored for, you know, by a lot of, uh, by a lot of entrepreneurs who, I guess, focusing more on the fintech side of things. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Jehan. Over to you, Nelly. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nelly Shatoudjop. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Cameroon. I'm the CEO and founder of Ijaha. Uh, so we are operating across 10 countries in Francophone Africa, and we plan to expand to the diaspora starting in France this year. Uh, our major concern at EJA, our major uh, mission is really to give access to uh, financial services to uh, the on underserved, our underserved communities. So we started with investment and saving uh, services. So people being able to uh, invest and save from as low as $1.5. And we are leveraging blockchain technology to make it more secure, more transparent, and also more accessible. Wonderful, thank you so much. And over to you, Sebastian. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Sebastian. I'm an investment officer at Axiom Venture Lab. Axiom Venture Lab is an early stage global venture capital investor where we focus on financial services uh, for the underserved and small businesses. We are part of Axiom, a global nonprofit focused on financial inclusion. Wonderful. And unfortunately, two of our other panelists are having some technical issues. Um, but in the meantime, we will just ask some questions to the audience. We're super curious to know where you're from and what's one key takeaway that you're looking forward to today. So please feel free to put that in the chat. But in the meantime, we'll get straight into the conversation. Um, oh, Tofin is actually here. Uh, apologies for that, Tofin. Over to you, please. Could you turn on your camera and your mic? While Tofin uh, turns on his camera and his mic, we'll get into the questions. And once he returns, we'll be happy to uh, allow him to introduce himself. But the first question was, when it comes to financial inclusion, what comes to the panelists' minds when it comes to like some of the challenges and the opportunities just in one line? Um, I'll start with Jihan, we'll continue with Nelly, and then we'll go over to Sebastian. So over to you, Jihan. Um, thanks. Um, I would say that, you know, financial inclusion is particularly from an insurance standpoint, I would say that, you know, we often ignore the financial security aspect of financial inclusion. Um, so I would say that, you know, it's being able to access all sorts of financial products, but also learning how to protect um, your assets, your, your, your finances, um, and putting yourself in that position of, of, of power uh, with the knowledge that you might have within the space. So I would say that for me, um, especially coming from Africa where people are very reliant on single sources of income, I think that uh, financial inclusion for me means uh, financial security as well. Awesome, thank you so much. And how about yourself, Nelly? How do you look at 
uh, the question? What comes to your mind? So what comes to my mind is education first, uh, because uh, as Jihan mentioned, uh, in Africa, a lot of people still fall prey of scams. And I was even more astonished to learn that even like middle class income people that I will expect to be more financially educated were also lagging behind when it comes to what makes a sound investment. Is this platform safe or not? Uh, how can I diversify my portfolio? How can I safe in a way that protects and grow my wealth. Uh, so education, 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 so that is kind of, a, for me, the main challenge when it comes to financial inclusion. And when it comes to opportunities, I mean, I feel like there is a blue ocean, to be honest, like anywhere you look at, there is a, a, a way to disrupt the system. Gian is doing that with insurance. We've been doing that with like asset management type of products, uh, with cryptocurrencies, with digital assets in many forms. So like totally blue ocean when it comes to financial inclusion in, in Africa. Wonderful. And Sebastian, as an investment officer uh, and as someone who, you know, invests into the early stage, what are some things that comes to your mind when you think of uh, financial inclusion? Yeah, certainly. I, first of all, I echo what, what Yihan and Nelly have said, but it, for me, it really comes down to access of financial services that are well designed and affordable for either the individuals or the small businesses that will, that will utilize them. And I think we've seen what this means to evolve over time, right? So at Axiom, we've been working on this since the 60s, and you've seen kind of all these revolutions of financial products um, that, that have been, uh, you know, designed, that are coming, you know, we saw the evolution of microfinance. And now what we, what we really are excited about is how do you leverage technology to kind of take what exists now and, and bring it to the next level. So I will say it's, it comes down to these two things. But the way we're seeing going forward is leveraging technology to really un unlock access to these financial services. Awesome. And welcome to the conversation, uh, Tofini. It would be great if you could introduce yourself and then also give us uh, some of your two cents on the question. And you are on mute in case, uh, yeah. So thanks, thanks. I uh, apologize, I'm uh, had some challenges connecting, but my name is Tofen Kama. I'm the principal uh, for Mercy Corps in West Africa, essentially uh, Francophone Africa, but also Nigeria, Ghana, and the rest of West Africa. Uh, Mercy Corps is um, a global investor. Uh, we invest mostly in the global South. Um, there's a significant portfolio here in Africa, more than 30 companies and a few of them in Latin America. We have that very special connection between Latin America and, and Africa. I used to remind people that these are two regions which share the same type of uh, struggles and challenges. Sometimes when we see a business running in Latin America, uh, you can anticipate the same also um, operating in our region. We have much more proximity between what's happening between both than for example, between Africa and Europe or between Africa and the US. Uh, we invest a lot in fintech. Um, we also invest, obviously, more recently in climate. So it's one of our main drivers in the future. And a core a principle of investment is about diversity. It's really, really a strong case, not just for doing good, but for the sound of the business. Like we have a significant track record with uh, diversity founders, female founders, and this is something that we are also growing uh, in, the, in this region uh, in the next coming months. Um, Thank you, sir. Now coming back, yeah, coming Sorry, back to the question of <laughs> coming back for the question of financial inclusion. Just for reference, I had a career in payment and uh, fintech before moving to VCs. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked with the very early days of Empeta. I think back then Safaricom has like had like fifty transactions per day or something. So it was really, really in the early days, and the puzzle was back then what would be the role of those services? Like, for example, would we invest more resources into providing water, uh, food security than financial services and mobile phones? And that question is pretty much answered. Um, financial services are really, really the fuel for all of those different things. You can't really grow ag without financial services. You can't grow education without financial services. 
So it's basically the hook between all those different things that we need in our region. And that's at least the lens we are looking at it. It's a, it's a fall. If you don't have it, you probably won't scale the rest. Just as like goods have to circulate between countries, between communities, money has mm -hmm. to do the same. If there is friction in the way money moves, nothing will mm -hmm. grow. And mm -hmm. nothing will grow. It means that what we are looking for in terms of development, in terms of community growth will not happen. So financial services, really, really inclusion is really an important piece. And this is also a core in our investment. Got it. Thank you so much. That is super, super helpful. And this is a question, and we'll start with Jihan again. As you guys know, um, there's an African saying that, you know, if you educate a woman, you educate a village. Um, and in Africa specifically, entrepreneurship isn't necessarily um, a choice, it's a necessity and it's a means of life. And many of us are entrepreneurs without even realizing it. However, despite that, there seems to be a gap. What would you say the reason is for the gap um, in your experiences as founders? And what have you done to almost overcome that gap as you both run uh, businesses and you've been able to attract investments, whether it's through finance, support, or even having employees buy into what you're doing? Um, I would say some of the gaps that we see, particularly in the insurance space, is really around products. So having tailored yeah. products that are actually catering to the needs of women or even products that can attract women uh, to purchase them. So some of the things that we've been able to do, for example, with our medical products, uh, we've tried to create products for, for mothers, you know, people who are women who are having children, um, you know, that don't have waiting periods for maternity, all these kinds of things that are very important for women, but less important, of course, um, uh, I mean, can be seen as a risk sometimes for some insurance companies. So we're trying to help them understand that although some of these products are risky, the you know, traditionally women are considered less risky as uh, insured people. So that can also be, for example, with the motor products that we have, uh, generally we see a lot less claims uh, for uh, women or products purchased by women, whether that's around, um, even, even from medical products all the way to motor insurance products uh, or um, you know, certain kinds of general uh, insurance products. So I'd say that's the first thing. And then also, how do we reach women? So how are we able to actually target and actually reach some of these women and so we try our best to, you know, make sure that our products that, you know, whether we're, when we're doing online marketing, we're targeting um, women with certain campaigns or certain kinds of products. So that I think has, uh, has been quite uh, successful for us. Um, but I think, of course, there's still the difficulty of reaching women who are maybe don't have access to some some kinds of technology, because I think generally we see that, you know, women have less access to smartphones versus men. Um, so it means that, you know, they might not be able to be targeted in the right way. Um, so we're trying also to see, you know, how can we use more informal methods of reaching women, whether that's through groups um, or, you know, kinds of like different kinds of channels where we're going on the ground sometimes uh, for, for some of these uh, campaigns. Um, and I think that is also uh, an important way to be able to actually ensure that, you know, they are accessing some of these products. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jihan. And over to you, Nelly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, co I completely agree uh, with, with Jihan on, on the fact that uh, you need uh, first to structure the, your product in a way that is attractive to women as well as, as well as men, because you want to be inclusive, definitely. Uh, a way we did that also at Ijaha, because we started as a crypto company. So even if you look at the stats worldwide, like fewer than 5% of women are on crypto exchanges or the likes. So, but for me, it was very important to attract women. So it was in, in, in embodied in our message. So we were never portraying crypto as a casino, as a gamble, as a way to uh, get rich quick scheme. Mm -hmm. We really wanted to uh, we really engage into what is your project? Maybe you want to start uh, 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 buying uh, some Bitcoin on a weekly, on a monthly basis for your kids' future. Let's talk about like this, uh, maybe like next stage of your mm -hmm. Uh, a, a little business you want to reach, maybe investing a little bit into crypto can can help you reach that. And why? And when doing that, you know, like during the uh, our first two years, we managed to onboard like forty percent of women users across our platform. And if you 
know the stat that women are even the biggest savers in Africa, although they have less than men, they save a little bit more and more responsibly. So it's really, it's really important to focus on this target and to onboard them and to help them better build and protect that wealth. And as we were talking to women, we realized that they were also developing a big appetite for less volatile products. So that led us also. So instead of trying to push a product we thought about to them, we listened to them and we designed this kind of saving product around like uh, uh, tokenizing sovereign bonds, which were which is a little bit safe for women because it bears like regular interest and no risk on, on capital. And you were asking like, what is the gap? Like why? Because if you even uh, 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 see that, I think in Africa, 24% of women are entrepreneurs. And uh, the last that I, I, I read and, but entrepreneur because they don't have any other means of earning a, a living, but they are usually their businesses, stay very informal very small because they need more help to uh, uh, know how to grow it and also access to credit to loans so in the process of building like this financial hub uh, that serve this on the self community we might also have to to jump into that how do we address this kind of gap in credit access in loan access when it comes to women and i will finish by uh, stressing out the importance of reaching them in informal ways uh, we grow we grew to our first 100,000 users without spending a dime on ads or even digital marketing. So we, yeah. we put out their agents, a lot of female agents that will go on the market, that will go like where women gather together on the weekends, like everywhere we could, we, we could find women and other like primary targets for us and we engage with them. And as we onboard women, they, will be, they became our ambassadors. Uh, yeah. One funny thing to finish is that right now we are onboarding more and more women merchants. And what we see is that they, allow us to put flyers of Ijaha on, on their little uh, uh, stalls. So, and it creates like some kind of billboards across the cities without even investing a dime into like a, a, a billboard. So that's also how I feel like sometimes as a tech woman founder, I feel alone because I don't have a lot of other women tech founder to interact with. But those small merchant women became my crew because you know they are pushing, they are pushing Ijaha, they are pushing me. And I feel like, okay, maybe this is like where us as women founder, we should also find some support. That's wonderful. And just quick question, just curious, uh, what blockchain are you building on? If you could share with oh. the audience, we keep it as- no, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we are um, completely yeah. agnostic. So, so as of now, we offer uh, 13 cryptocurrencies and for each of them, because we are non-custodial wallet, we launch a note and we, and we do like everything. So like it goes from Bitcoin to uh, Cardano, Tezos and yeah. Thank you so much. And no, over to you, Sarah. just curious to know, what are your thoughts when it comes to financial inclusion and building on the blockchain specifically? Yeah, I mean, we're quite excited about, about new technologies. I think for us, the, the big question and in, in, in what, we're, what we're analyzing with a few different um, potential investments is how, how are you differentiating this, this opportunity, and particularly when it comes to financial inclusion, what kind, what kind of uh, new solutions or product design are you bringing to the table? And I think that's what gets us really excited about fintech in, in general. I think we now see uh, through, through a bunch of different um, technology approaches, either new access points to acquire customers in a more efficient manner or new data uh, to design new, new product. And, we, and we, we see a lot of entrepreneurs building a grabbing kind of the combination of these two to build new products that address the needs of new of new population and I, and I will note that one of the things that we take um, particularly when we think about a women's financial inclusion we take particular note of how can we invest in more women founders because I think that the big question here is that in, in early stage companies so much of the product designs and the product choices are going to be designed a uh, this time by this, this initial founding team. And if you don't really have a diverse team, it's almost like a missed opportunity where you're not, you're not really having a founder that can truly understand the needs of, of, their, of their client base. So we, we also believe that it's not, just about, it's not just about the technology, it's obviously what you do with it, but also the founding team that's building on top of it. Most, most, uh, you know, we, we get excited when we see a team that brings a unique perspective into the field. 
That's helpful. Thank you so much. And piggybacking off that uh, sentiment of Sebastian, uh, to you, uh, Tofin, I'm curious to know what are some of the misconceptions uh, that you guys see when it comes to investing in women and why is gender lens investing such an important focus uh, of your work? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> let me maybe start with a, with a story. Um, I've been looking at something called Synthropic Agroforestry uh, for the last, let's say, 18 months. It's this whole idea that when you are producing food, you should just follow nature and not basically come with um, all too artificial ways of doing it. There is a whole thing about this between Africa, Latin America. And one of the crazy and most interesting principles in, um, in Synthropic is this idea that diversity is key. Um, you will never probably see a, a field in, the, in, in nature, in a forest where you have rows and rows and rows of hectares of corn and only corn. Nature doesn't do that. And if you ever do that, you'll also spend a lot of energy trying to uh, remove the side effects. You have to have, basically, you'll have a lot of issues with pests. You'll have a lot of issues with soil because all these different, uh, probably the same, exact same, uh, uh, nutrients, but if you had a significant diversity there, sorry, I have a lot of noise here, you know. No, you're fine. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> so, so, so this is just saying that in terms of companies, we see really a lot of um, similarities between how ecosystems and how startups grow with the same way as how ecosystem in nature work. A company is essentially a team, a product, and customers. If you don't have enough diversity in the product, not enough diversity in the team, not enough diversity in the, in the, in the customer base, you will have the same effect as somebody who does monoculture. You'll have to spend a lot of energy fighting the side effects, whether it's cultural side effects, whether it's marketing side effects. I'm very happy to hear what Nelly was saying about uh, women uh, uh, customers because they feel in synthropy with what you're doing, so they have no problem um, um, pushing the product, right? So we feel like we feel like diversity is really the norm by which nature functions. And in investing, this is also should be the norm for every investor. Like what we're doing, trying to incentivize more women founders shouldn't be like exception. It should be the norm. That should be like, even in nature. If you look at how our population grow, you have almost a little bit even more women than men. So it means that nature has tested and tried this for for millions of years. We should be just doing that. Shouldn't be like anything special at all. So diversity is super important for us. And we look at it both from a customer base and also from a team base. And the result that we see, for example, if you look at the studies, I don't have the exact metrics, but there is a there is a statistic that we saw that was the percentage of founders that move from pre seed to series A and then from series A to later stage. Um, if you do that calculation based on female founders, you'd probably see a much higher degree of success. So it mm -hmm. means that actually there is nothing that incentivize, should incentivize funds to focus more on male founders rather than female founders. It should be actually the reverse. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, excellent. And actually, just a segue on that to Jihan and Nelly. Um, when it came to access to funding, what were some of the barriers that you guys faced and what were some of the learning curves? Or what took you by surprise, perhaps, throughout the process? Um, I would say that they, <laughs> it was difficult to understand. I guess having worked in a male-dominated environment before, I used to work in finance. It's not; a, it was not really a surprise to be, um, you know, to see how few women they were in the entrepreneurship space as well. Um, I would say that what I was, what I found difficult was the fact that actually. Um, what people say versus how they what they do was very different. So, like for example, you know, we always hear that um, a lot of funds are saying, "Yeah, we want to focus on women. We want to invest in more women." But at the end of the day, the people who you're talking to are all men, mm -hmm. and I think at that point it becomes also quite difficult to um, for for them to actually overcome this barrier that they have. They, I think it creates subconscious uh, uh, barriers without them realizing to an extent. Um, the initial first year of LAMI, actually, I was not able to fundraise at all. I didn't know what to do. I had no background in, you know, entrepreneurship in, in I guess, in the venture space. 
So I found it very difficult. So what I did was I actually invested my own savings and um, got some money from my family as the initial seed capital to start. And then after that, after you know, starting to uh, build my confidence and and I guess that process of learning how to speak to investors, which you don't really you have to learn on the on the job pretty much, right? So I think for me that was that was a very big learning curve, you know, how to present yourself in the best way to attract investors. What do they want to hear? How do you make yourself look good? How do you even use different investors uh, throughout the process to actually um, increase your understanding of what they're looking for and, and tailor your pitch and everything. So that was a very big learning for me, big learning curve. And what was very interesting, I guess, when you look at the investors that we have on board, um, most of the investors that led investments in us were actually women, which is, I think, a very interesting statistic when you look at it. Um, my first investor, uh, institutional investor was actually Axiom. And um, the person who was leading the investment actually saw me speaking on a panel. So in the mm. most random place, but I think they were actually trying to find and look for uh, great businesses and women. So I think that was that was a very interesting um, initial journey. But I think nonetheless, what the biggest learning was how important it is for me to, I guess, speak to more women learn from their experiences and also help those that are coming after me to, to make their process and journey much easier. Yeah, thank you so much. Super interesting story and congratulations. You raised almost $4 million. So clearly it looks like you're getting better uh, on the job. Uh, and over to you, Nelly. Uh, what are some of your uh, insights in that so regard? I was smiling and laughing in my heart while Gillian was speaking because uh, it happens that uh, we share like a pretty much similar story. When I started Ijara, I didn't even know what fundraising was. I was like, okay, I'm gonna invest my own saving. And I think like fundraising took me by surprise because uh, the it's a woman that led my my first investment, and we met on Twitter. <laughs> we met on Twitter, and uh, and like one year later, she was she was leading uh, my investment, Melton Demiros from Conscious. And it happens that also for Ijaha, most of the most of the investors like are women, and like you know, or uh, uh, most of the big investment have been led by women. So it shows something. It shows that the diversity at the VC firm really means, I mean, makes a lot of difference for us women founders. But I also have to put like a, a, a tiny kind of um, I don't know, like how to structure it in English since like French is my first language, but my worst experience has also been with women because what I what I saw is that in the VC space, you have like those women that really don't want to be seen as maybe pushing women for the sake of pushing women. And they tend to be like a little bit tougher with us, uh, condes condescending, like it's the way I felt it. So it wasn't like normal rejection. It was like really condescending rejection. So it was very surprising for me as a women founder to face that. But of course, like it was more than confronted by the ones that were really like uh, 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 really open minded and really helpful to 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 get me there. Uh, one other challenge we face as women founders is that when I was looking for like more advice, uh, how to move forward, uh, would be faced in my ecosystem with like a bro culture because most of the founders are male, they hang out together, uh, they go take like, you know, uh, drinks at night. I can't, I, I, I have two little kids. I, I need to stay with my kids. So I don't do like drinks at night or everything. So it, it really made my life difficult not to have like this, you know, uh, 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 this crew, like those people that could help me also uh, uh, move like a little bit faster. Uh, but ultimately, you know, I decided that I might be the one that created that ecosystem for like other women that come uh, behind. So let's just do it. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for your insights, Nelly. Super interesting. And to the investors on the call, how do you guys see yourself as allies or how do you see yourself as creating an equitable environment so that women can, you know, access support, whether it's guidance or whether it's mentorship, as Nelly mentioned. If you are a mother, how do you balance that? As Jihan mentioned uh, before as well, breaking into a male-dominated industry can be um, relatively hard to navigate as there isn't a rule book on how to you know, fundraise and so forth. So I would love to hear uh, what are some of the conceptions that people typically have and what are uh, some of your advice and insights for anyone who's on the call who wants to go down a similar route as Jihan and Nelly. Yeah, certainly I can start. I mean. 
I think at, at uh, Action Venture Lab, we really, really thought about, you know, where can we truly add, add value here? And, and it goes beyond, I think, quite naturally, we, we invest in female founders, we look, we look for female founders, uh, but also I think it expanded beyond that. And one of the things we did as part of our gender lens investing strategy was a uh, See where where our strength lie and how can we help the, the biggest amount of founders, right? So what we realize is we have a very unique position. We are a global fund. We have very deep net, networks that trust us. That we, uh, particularly other other investors who have either co-invested with us or look at uh, our investment thesis as something that you know that is valuable to them as well. So what we decided to do is let one invest in female founders. But for those that we don't invest, because naturally we can't invest in, in all female founders out there, how can we make sure that, that we're putting them in a position where they're able to talk to the right people? So one of the things we're trying to do is, can we champion early stage female founders that are maybe too early for us or not exactly at the fit? And can we connect them to resources uh, or, or, or networks to, so that they can ultimately acquire capital? So we do a lot of work trying to figure out you know, when we go to an, a new ecosystem. Uh, so for example, in Latin America, we've done a, a few different events where we bring investors in a network and just introduce them to relevant female founders. And I think just being a little bit more proactive, it goes a long way because ultimately we do have those networks, we don't have those access points and we should be, we should be you know, making sure that uh, founders are in that position to, you know, they shouldn't be struggling to get that first meeting if they're a fit, right? So I think we, we try to focus on that. And then the, the second piece is we also help founders on a more day-to-day -day basis, right? So the other part where we have a strong advantage is in the governance side, side of things. So we're usually participating in the boards of our companies. Uh, we're usually working very closely with the founders, male or female. So can we make sure that we, we push for things like adding female members to boards, adding female members to the middle, uh, middle management tiers of companies. And I think that's where we try to do quite a bit of work, either just by suggesting it or finding the right profiles for, for, um, for portfolio companies. But I think it comes down to just being you know, conscious that this is the problem, that there is an opportunity here. And it goes, uh, not, it's not just you know, doing it because we, we think it's a problem and, and, and we just you know, want to address it, but also we realize it, it benefits your business. And it's a missed opportunity if we're not doing it. So just when you realize that, it just makes total sense to be proactive and, and try to incorporate it into everything you do with your, with your founders. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, super, super insightful. And over to you, uh, Tafin. I'm also curious to know when it comes to um, investing in women in Africa versus Asia versus Latin America, do you see anything uh, different? Well, definitely there is, there is, very honestly, there is a difference. Um, but the difference is also not surprising. Um, mm. I'll basically answer in two ways. The first way is going to be more like in principle and the rest going to be like more concrete to what we are doing. Um, I'm from Senegal. Nelly is from Cameroon. Both of us know uh, when football was like a new thing. I remember probably I'm a bit old enough for that, but when Roger Mila and so were playing the World Cup and here in Senegal, when the early days of Jules Francois Bocande uh, were playing, all of a sudden we saw Africans moving from Africa, sometimes from villages, being sent to Milan, I say, being friends to some of the top European leagues. And they were not only playing, but they were even better uh, than many others. And it became mm -hmm. a phenomenon. Uh, 10 years later, you come back to many of these regions, you have um, a lot of kids that uh, feel like football is the way to go. And they have no mm -hmm. fear of doing it. And that's why we have a lot of like progress in the African football because they have role models, they have a playbook. Everyone knows, like the exit plan for being a footballer is known if you have a bit of talent, wherever you are in Africa today, whether we are in a little village in Senegal or in Bamenda or in wherever in Cameroon, people know. It's the exact same thing as entrepreneurship. We don't have that much women entrepreneur in tech because mm -hmm. there is not enough uh, role models. So it's our role as, as, as funds to initiate mm -hmm. that process. 
coming back to always agroforestry, when you have a new ecosystem, the first thing you do is plant pioneer species. So sorry to say that this way, Nelly, but you guys are also uh, the pioneer species. And then everything else is gonna depend on how successful you are, how open you are to help others, because they're gonna look at you as the way to go. If you make it, the, uh, my daughter who is looking at doing entrepreneurship will not be afraid of getting in there because she can find role models. That is at least in theory. So we have a role as fun to incentivize those pioneer species. <laughs> Sorry to say it that way. Uh, now, more concretely in Mexico, we definitely incorporate this obviously first in our team. So maybe I should have been a female today being here, but we just wanted to make it <laughs> almost random. I'm here. We also have women in the team here. Um, uh, but, but we also take in almost in our, all our process, we have a score for being, for example, uh, women founders. We look at that. Even when we are looking at the pipeline, we have that as a score. The second thing we are doing is that during the investment, we really don't make absolutely any difference. We actually even sometimes prefer female founders because just in terms of track record, it shows a significant slight difference between women and, and men. And, and the last thing we do as just like action is we have also a significant post-investment support team uh, that is also following up to help in governance, to help in recruiting uh, the right executive. And we insist, absolutely insist, in the executive team, either in the founding team or in the next uh, uh, following management to have significant diversity and women. And we are not doing this just because we want to be good or seen as good. We are seeing it, doing it just because it's really, really efficient. If the team is diversified, somebody will, will, will stand up and say to the founder that this is not the way to go. And that's really, really critical, especially here in Africa, where you have so many other issues of governance. If somebody is able to come and see, this is the market looks like, I'm close to this category of customers, and this is what we should do and can stand to the founder and say, this is the way to go. We have significant process on um, uh, like basically opportunities to, for the company to, to, to be successful. If it is just one way of thinking, it's generally lead to a lot of side effects that we all know about. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you so much. That's super, super comprehensive and insightful. I mean, just kind of pivoting a little bit into questions regarding products specifically. Uh, so this is to Jihan and to Nelly. When it comes to products, what are some futures or what are some requests that you hear from women in terms of what they would like to experience? Or what are some gaps that you have perhaps realized that, OK, this could be something interesting uh, to implement for our women audience? And while yes, you wonder the uh, question, uh, uh, Jihan and Nelly will ask yeah. some questions uh, to the audience. So, you know, take your time uh, to ponder it. But in the meantime, we'll ask the audience some questions which they should be able to see on their screen. But over to you, Jihan. Um, I think for us, one of the most interesting areas that um, we're looking at at the moment is really around SMEs. So SMEs have always been a, a target for us. Um, of course, here in, in Kenya, you see that a lot of small businesses are actually owned by women. So we're really trying to see like what kind of uh, products we can create for this uh, segment. We've tried uh, to create new products and standardize existing products as well so that we can actually create new flows um, for purchasing of, of some of these SME products. Um, and I think it's also uh, for us what we've seen is how can we bundle uh, female specific products or uh, personal products within um, business lines. So for example, if we're selling a product for protection of somebody's business, um, you know, what other products can we add and combine uh, specific, uh, specifically for women within that? So whether we can add like kinds of medical plans or medical insurance plans for families. Um, so we're trying to see um, in that particular area what we can do. Um, we're also trying to see how we can incentivize insurance companies to actually um, provide um, based on the portfolio that we have um, and the history of claims, whether they can provide additional discounts um, and, uh, you know, uh, more attractive uh, premiums for women, because as I mentioned before, they are considered less risky. We, we do see from our own book that their, you know, their claim levels are significantly lower. So being able to actually convince these insurance companies that actually that should be a factor in determining price for them, I think will really be a game changer in, in giving them uh, better price products and hopefully attracting more women um, onto some of these product lines. Awesome. And how about yourself, Nelly? So uh, when we, we launched uh, our crypto wallet, what was funny was that a lot of women, we had that request so many times, 
wanted us to create soft wallets for their kids because they will come, mm -hmm. they will have like two, three, four kids and they, and they will say like, okay, I want to spread out my investment across all my kids. So how can I do that? How, how do you uh, develop like a feature that, that, that really solves that, that problem? Because I'm not saving for me, I'm saving for my kids for their future. So that's what we observe in crypto. When we launched, we launched uh, uh, four months uh, ago, our saving product. That is basically uh, taking the sovereign bonds that are guaranteed by the central bank and tokenizing them on the blockchain to make them affordable because we are fractionalizing them by $1.5. A lot of women really love that product because like you earn 5% uh, a year, uh, no capital risk involved. But then uh, we made it flexible because when we did our market research, we thought that, okay, I mean, we are targeting people that usually, even if they do save, they have an emergency in their life. And unfortunately, like the, the level of insurance is at 2% in, in, across like Francophone Africa. So they really need to tap into their saving. They really need to release those funds. And a lot of women came back and said, no, I want you to design like a, a, a kind of block accounts because, you know, I'm saving for a goal. I'm saving for a project. Like right now, they are saving for uh, uh, the, the school season that starts like in September, October. So they won't really take to block the funds for like six months or, 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 or more in order to be able, you know, to, act, to, to, to really uh, achieve that goal. And by really like always like interacting and what really helped us having like this constant feedback and this close loop between like a, a, a customer feedback and product is the agent that we have on the ground. Uh, because like every single day, like they, they, we have like this platform where they put in like all the comments and then like all the team get into that, like even tech team uh, in order to optimize, like because like one time our app like grow so large and we noticed that a, a lot of underserved communities including like many more women have uh, really like smartphones that are not uh, sophisticated enough so we needed like to to make sure that we, we really reduce the app to a minimum like the app size uh, we really work a lot onto like optimizing like the display like minimizing the the data consumption of our app so all those kind of things that we are aware of and that we work on is only because we have this constant feedback from that target. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nelly. And for the sake of time, uh, Sebastian and Torin will go into the last question before we take questions from the audience. But the question is specifically around trends. What are some interesting trends that you guys are seeing in terms of decks that you're receiving uh, from founders and startups? And are there any specific trends that uh, you find interesting when it comes to financial inclusion in women? Certainly, I, I can start. I mean, one of the things we're extremely excited about it, uh, at Action Venture Lab is embedded finance. And when we talk about embedded finance, it's really the inclusion of financial services uh, through channels that have traditionally been non-financial. So maybe think of like a small restaurant selling through an online platform, and suddenly you can access things like credit directly through a platform. We actually even have a company in our portfolio, Dini, that's doing exactly this in Brazil. And what's interesting about them uh, is especially in, from a point of view of financial inclusion, is that you can leverage not only the access that you get through these platforms, it's not just getting your credit very easily through a click of a button, but also new data sets that allow you to design products that are better tailored for this use case or that include populations that otherwise wouldn't be able to access financial services through maybe like traditional credit analysis. And what we've seen is in the industries where um, there's a large concentration of, of, of women entrepreneurs that can be truly transformational. So, for example, we have two cases, one in Latin America, uh, through Tienda Pago, and one in Southeast Asia with Fairbank that work with corner shop. And they use the data that they get through their apps uh, around the um, inventory turnover to finance loans. And what we found is that these, these uh, corner shops are mostly owned and operated by women. In fact, in about 58% of their customers are women, for Fairbank, it's 70%. So we really see kind of this new trend unlocking access to financial services in, in verticals where there's a large concentration of women founders. Uh, the other thing I, I would like to highlight here, though, is, is there is a lot of opportunity, of course, with these type of solutions. But we also like working with teams that understand 
uh, the risks and the biases that are behind this. And we want to make sure that as we implement this new technology, we don't almost like compound the negative effects or the barriers that have kept a female users out a, a you know disproportionately outside of, of, of financial services. So we really do a lot of work in sharing information, for example, on new AI models. We see a lot of potential there, but there's also tons of potential harmful biases within them. So we try to work with these founders to see the opportunities, seize it, and, and create new things, but also um, make sure that, that we're doing so in a responsible way, in a way that, that can really maximize the positive impact. Interesting. Thank you so much, especially uh, embedded finance and AI. Super interesting. Uh, to mm -hmm. how do you uh, see that question? What are some thoughts that come to you? Yeah, we, we see exactly the same trend in terms of embedded finance. Um, I think 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, well, finance here was more like access to accounts, uh, which is mm -hmm. what mobile money has allowed to do uh, for probably way, way too long. Um, seven, seven, eight years ago, we started to see a little bit more than just money transfer and, and uh, store of funds, but we started to see lending. Um, more recently, we are seeing people going beyond lending and adding, we are seeing, for example, a lot of interesting insurance uh, cases, very, very mm -hmm. smart cases of getting uh, insurance to democratize. Uh, we are seeing also more and more in like, investment cases, just like the case of, of Nelly. Um, I think that there is really one thing I could, there is probably one way to look at all this, which is in Africa in general, and this is valid for investment, but also valid for, for startups. Sometimes the, dis the distinction we do between different form of payments or different form of financial services doesn't exist. Like we like to think of uh, saving, uh, insurance, uh, lending, but the most common, let's say, financial service in Africa, for example, is those pontines and susu and so on. So every time you explain this to somebody, they're going to say, oh, this is like part saving and part credit. But an African doesn't see it that way. You are part in a group, and there mm -hmm. is a continuum of service between saving and lending, depending on just what you need. So we are seeing more of that, that people are basically combining saving, payment, insurance, lending in a continuum of service. Uh, for the service of a particular product. And sometimes we call it embedded insurance or embedded um, uh, finance. But in reality, it's just that you are extending the normal service to add finance to it, regardless of what is the um, primitive that you are using. And I, I really like that idea of continuum of service. Uh, and we like when we see a fintech company that just doesn't do just lending, that is also providing saving, that is providing a continuum of service because it's the only way to serve customers. So uh, we are seeing mostly the same, the, the, the same trend, I think, uh, in the sector. That's super helpful. And just uh, a protocol to the participants on the call. I just wanted to remind you that if you want to use the word cloud, you have to go into the platform itself. And on the right side of your screen, you should be able to access the questions there. And then you can just answer uh, the questions on that. If that's not clear, please feel free to share it in the chat. It will just help you uh, with it. So to repeat again, please go on your right side of the screen. And then once you go on the right side of your screen, there should be a tab. And on that tab itself, you can manually uh, populate it and you can insert your questions there uh, or your answers and so forth. Um, and we have about 12 minutes left of the discussion before we open up the Q&A. So in the meantime, feel free to populate the Q&A for our uh, panelists so that they can answer it. Uh, but while we still have some time, Jihan and Nelly, this is a question to both of you. I guess, what is a win that you guys have had recently with your businesses? And what are some of the key blockers that you guys face? Um, there might be someone in the audience uh, that could essentially, you know, help or, you know, collaborate with you guys and so forth. So, yeah, um, I'll go with you, Nelly, this time, and then we'll take it over to Jihan. Well, this, this, is, this is a tough one. Uh, so let me start by, by your block uh, instead, of, uh, instead of a wonder. Uh, I will list two. Um, one of the things like, you know, uh, uh, Ijaha, we've been, uh, we've been, 
growing really like despite all odds, um, uh, like 15% month for month approximately. But one of the major blockers since day one has been uh, kind of accessing FX because we operate in Francophone Africa with uh, XAF and XOF, the CFA franc pack to euros. And to be able to balance corridors because when you operate in crypto, you are essentially buying your inventory in dollars or euros. And why, like when you having like a lot of CFA on the other hand, so how can you find like those right partners that can really make sure that to help you balance the corridors, whether import exports, whether NGOs that need to disperse like CFA from to the zone. Yeah, so this kind of one of the blocker. Another one is regulations, but this is the one that at least you know how to manage because as licenses start to like as more and more countries start to regulate around like around fintech, around crypto, around blockchain services, we really keep on the pace of going and country by country, uh, 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 applying for licenses and, and getting it. As far as the wonder is concerned, I, I was really like, my ears were all open when uh, uh, Sebastian and, and, and Tofin mentioned embedded finance, because like yesterday I was discussing with, uh, with my, a new member of my team, a new executive, and he was like, oh, why don't we buy this company? They are democratizing insurance. And I feel like it's a really a great addition because EJA is about like financial inclusion, so, so, uh, uh, society inclusion, I'm like, I've never thought about it, but that's, you know, why not? And, you know, and, and suddenly I, 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 the way I was seeing my company, because usually I present it as an investment and saving company. And today is the first time I present it. Oh, this is like a financial services, like up where we want to be like one-stop shop for everything. And now Tofin gave me the right justification. We are just replicating the Tontins. We are just replicating the community. So good for it. Tofin, I'm going to come see you for my series this <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I hope you put action when your mod when you, when your words are. So yeah, I think that <laughs> we we've been all the way. Oh, we've been with you all, all all along. So no problem. I know, I know, I know. You've been like <laughs> wonderful, wonderful investors. Yeah, we love you at Ija. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Nelly. And yes, we're all on the call, so we'll hold Tofin accountable to it. Um, and over to you, Jia. Uh, I would say for us, one of the difficult parts is uh, that, I mean, issues that always creep up is around insurance products. So we rely on insurance companies to provide us with the products. We don't we don't underwrite or carry any risk ourselves. So sometimes in some instances, it's quite difficult to get the right product or even in some cases when we're testing a product, um, you know, insurance companies might change their mind about whether they want to be selling such a product. So we do have some difficulty around that that can be erratic in some cases, but for the most part, we try to have multiple uh, providers for the same product so that we're able to balance. Um, another problem generally that we're seeing, I think similar to everywhere in the world is really around inflation. And the problem with inflation and in insurance is the fact that the asset value of any asset that you're insuring is changing, right? Essentially in the sense that, you know, the, the monetary value assigned to it is, is going to be different based on the inflation level. So we had to really uh, take a bit of time to think around that problem. How do we uh, make sure that if, our, if a claim does come for some of our customers that they're actually getting the real value of their assets? So we've been working a lot recently with the insurance companies to see how we can like revalue a lot of um, the different assets that some of our customers have. Um, in terms of wins that we've had recently, I think the one of the biggest wins for us recently is uh, around launching our SME flow. So that was something that we were working on for a while. Uh, it's currently being tested and soon we're going to have it live. So I'm really excited about that because we're able to actually standardize a lot of our offering um, and target SMEs more broadly. Um, yeah, but I think there's most of the, with most startups, I would say there's uh, a lot of curveballs all the time. So it's probably more heavy on that side. <laughs> No worries. I mean, it's important to celebrate your wins. And I think women don't tend to do that. So I wanted to make sure that we made space for that. Um, and then over to our investors, just super curious to know, uh, what are some things that make you, you know, bet on a company? And what are other things that make you say no often to startups? I would assume that most people on the call, you know, are either looking for access to funding and access to support. Um, what are ways 
uh, that they can access mentorship or additional resources or anything that you could point them in the direction on this call would be super helpful, whether that is uh, from Jihan and Nelly later on, if you could also chime into that, that'd be helpful. I think Jihan spoke a lot about pulling those up behind you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we covered that as well. Uh, over to Sebastian first, please go ahead. You're the first person I see on yeah. my right. Sure. Yeah, not a problem. I mean, I think it's interesting. One one of the things we mostly see that makes us maybe pass on a company is really founders not being a, almost like ambitious enough or not having enough of a big vision. I think what's important to understand when you're raising venture capital uh, is that we're looking for really generational defining companies. We're looking for these these companies that can become extremely large that can that can, that can uh, you know reach a very very high milestones and if your your business plan is not ambitious enough it just simply is not the type of business that we would that we would invest in and i will say a, a lot of times uh, the the ambition is there or the uh, or the vision for something truly transformational is there and, and wh where it falters is on not communicating that effectively or almost being a uh, shy and thinking, hey, I have this idea that's truly going to change my market. And but it, it's almost sounds too crazy if I put it out there. So I'm going to say something a little bit more conservative. And I, and I would say, no, we want to hear these crazy ideas. We want to see is really transformational views. And I think it, where I've seen a lot of founders evolve and become better at pitching their ideas is, is when they go through a bunch of these meetings and they start realizing, hey, maybe I should be talking about really not just what I'm going to do in the next month or two, but really what this company looks like in five years, in 10 years. And, and it, it truly is exciting because I think that's when you get to really know the entrepreneur, when you really get to hear what they have to say, where, you, where they have almost like their unique insight. So my, my advice here is, one, make sure that you're always putting kind of the, your your best foot forward. You, you're really positioning yourself as someone who's going to transform whatever industry or market they, they want to work in and, and really communicate this passion of why you're dedicating essentially all of your time to, to building this, this new company from scratch. Uh, and then just, you know, as, as a, you know, make sure that as you go through this process of fundraising, taking the feedback, incorporating to your pitch. I think, I think this was mentioned before. I think it, it's critical. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it, it just unfortunately comes with times comes every, no one has this kind of perfect path to fundraising, but it's important just to learn, learn about the, you know, the, the, the feedback that you're getting and make sure your pitch really represents what you're truly trying to make. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. That's super helpful. And Tiffany, uh, sorry, I'm so sorry. I probably butchered your name so many times uh, on this call, uh, but I'd love to know uh, your thoughts on it and maybe like a line or two uh, for the sake of time. We'd have to pivot into the Q&A very soon. So over to you. Yeah, I, I think that I have really different recommendations depending on where you are starting your company from. Like if you are starting your company in a fresh ecosystem, um, let's say, for example, you're doing it in Cameroon, in Cote d'Ivoire, or in Senegal, it's slightly different from when you are launching a company in Kenya or in Nigeria. The environment you are launching is super important because the type of talents you have, the type of role models you have, the access to capital is different. And the market, initial market you have access to is also different. Um, now, based on what you are looking for, um, it's important also to see, to understand what investors are looking for. Like, obviously, as he was saying, no one is looking for the next SME that just going to be like doing business as usual. Um, venture capital is for businesses that are growing fast and have large scale uh, potential in terms of uh, in the future. So I really recommend people to focus more on the business. I see a lot of programs where people are taught to pitch better, to write a pitch deck and spend a lot of time talking about how they're gonna, uh, for example, do impact and all those different things. At the end of the day, I'd rather have a, a, a good company that has a bad pitch, that doesn't really explain things well, but where the business has a lot of sense and what they're doing, they understand precisely where they are putting their money. And they understand what the business could become tomorrow. You can correct those. 
unfortunately, depending on the ecosystem, we see a lot of founders that basically spend a crazy amount of effort on just the on the form and they follow the other uh, function. And forms should always follow function, right? Yeah. So I always say this to, to founders. Now, another thing often we see also is that especially in big ecosystem where people are trying to be the it for Africa. Those things work for certain uh, elements. I always say that Africa is nothing like anything else. Um, you might be building whatever for Africa. You will realize that to build that, you probably build 90% of the customization of that to make it work. So maybe you should just focus on building what obsess you rather than trying to be the X4. Now it's important to understand what has been done before though. If you are building, I don't know, a, a marketplace, it's important to understand how eBay started. If you are building a payment company, it's very important to understand how PayPal started and how they cracked, for example, the Cash 22. If you are building a mobility company, it's important to, to know how Uber starts a new city. Those are important, but you don't have to copy them, right? <laughs> if you copy them, you still have to do 90% of extra work, which means that you probably should have started just from scratch. So understanding mm -hmm. where you are putting your hands on, Understanding what other models exist and what make them work is important, but you'll always have to do things in a unique way in this region to, to succeed uh, in, a, in a nutshell. So we are looking for something special always in a startup. And despite the overall 90% of the pitch, you'll probably something 10% of the thing will basically tick and you want to dig deep on that. It's super important when you are explaining to be broad enough so we can catch that very little thing that we will focus on and that will make or break the investment. Awesome, thank you so much. Super, super insightful. And we'll now uh, go into the Q&A. So we'll spend the next 10 to 15 minutes just answering some questions from the audience. And the first question I will target it towards Jihan and Nelly is around whether you guys have seen any financial products that are targeted towards procuring menstrual products. So when it comes to, let's say, menstrual cups, they can be typically expensive to purchase outright. Are there any products that almost allow you to do the uh, buy now, pay later model? Or if you haven't seen it within menstrual cups specifically, have you seen in any other industries uh, that is focused on products that women would need? Um, that's a super niche um, area in, in the sense that I don't think I've seen it. I've seen companies that are offering these products and offering like uh, financial wellness advice and all those kinds of things, um, you know, helping women around that area, <clears throat> whether it's around pregnancy or it's around um, just, you know, your general health. But I haven't really seen financing for menstrual products, but I think that that's actually super, super interesting. And I think a, a really a really cool area. I see a lot of NGOs in the space. So a lot of NGOs providing uh, assistance and, and helping women um, uh, around that space. Um, but I haven't really seen uh, financing for it. Awesome. And how about yourself? Same, okay. <laughs> yeah, same, same answer as Jen. Yeah, no worries. Uh, well, this is a super interesting question as well, right? The question is around fintech companies. How do you balance product versus the needs of the people who have very low income? So yeah, that'd be interesting to get your thoughts on. So if I may start, uh, I think Toto Fin said it like, what matters is the business, right? You need economics have to work. Uh, when I jump into like starting this business, I had like a clear vision. I have like all the features I wanted to build for the next 30 years. I always said that I have like a roadmap for the next 30 years. Uh, obviously, you know, I had to make a lot of comp compromises uh, because sometimes like you might be in love with your product, with the feature, you need economics do, do not work. Uh, maybe it's because like the customer base is not, educated well enough to value that product at that moment. Maybe it's a question of timing. Maybe it's a question of area you are targeting. So a way I solve that is expanding to, now I'm starting expanding to other markets where I could try stuff that matters to me and, uh, and that I really want to do. And that seemed to find a product market fit with the customer base I'm addressing. But you really mm -hmm. have to make sure that uh, a unit economics works because you might have a wonderful product, but if nobody uses it, if it doesn't make, if it doesn't make the company like sounds, it doesn't make sense to start it, yeah, to exactly. launch it. 
Yeah, no, thank you so much. That's super interesting. And to our uh, investors on the call, what role do NGOs and INGOs play uh, when it comes to financial input slash access to credit when it comes to fintech specifically? Uh, maybe I can start with this one. Um, I, th I think that every type of financing is interesting. The important is just for the founder to know where and how to leverage it and not rely on a single source of the time. For example, mm -hmm. we do see some, some, some companies that have part physical infrastructure and part, hard, uh, part software, like everyone who is doing a little bit like digital ag, everyone who is doing like electric batteries and things like that, and there are more and more. Um, the typical um, puzzle they have to deal with is that um, the physical hardware is it essentially is funded by, 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 by lending, by some form of lending. But at an early stage, they don't have enough proof of proof that the business is sound, so they can't access, they can't go to a bank and, and, and get a loan. And we've seen a lot of cases where NGO um, and other sort of uh, free money and grants have been super helpful for um, very good founders to leverage that, whether it's 100K or 200K, to build a proof on the infrastructure side and still raise normal equity for the software. Uh, we've seen that really, really as super helpful. And remember, startup, uh, <laughs> startup in, in an ecosystem uh, uh, um, need those, those deep layer startups. Like for example, it, there is no point building a marketplace when there is no delivery and no payment. There is no uh, need, like you probably won't succeed that much if you are building logistics when the cost of energy is so high. Like there is always a sailing and somebody has to go deeper and deeper. And the deeper you go, the deeper you need that initial, like basically capital that can't come with VCs. Uh, and we see a lot of demand and a lot of use case for using NGOs, using grant money for that. Now, there is a flow that we see also on startup where you start with that and you start get stuck with that and you only chase um, NGO money. Um, unfortunately, that this does exist, for example, in a lot of ag tech companies. So there is a moment where you need to move away from that and build a business. It can be super helpful, though, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Super, super helpful. And Sebastian, any thoughts on that question? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree here. I think it's, it's, it's a great resource, but it is important to don't lose sight on what you're building for, right? So we, I agree, like here, NGOs will probably have other incentives, other metrics that they're tracking, and it's not necessarily exactly the same thing investors would look like. So if ultimately what you want to use is this initial maybe grant money or access to subsidized financing uh, to kickstart a, a venture scalable business, don't lose sight of kind of what are the milestones that you need to reach. I, I will say we do believe particularly for, for um, when you're building for a, a low income individuals or for building for, for micro and small businesses, there are other types of um, engagements you can do with local organizations or NGOs to maybe things like partnerships that can be quite valuable, particularly if they have a strong presence in your, um, in your target customer base. So making sure, you know, they can be strong allies, it's not necessarily just about obtaining grants. I think they have a wealth of information. They have a wealth of uh, access that you can leverage as a technology tool, uh, but don't never lose sight obviously of, of these more scalable path. I think what, what we quickly find is if you, a, a lot of times startups tend to grow really fast and their partners can't always adapt to this, or they might, you know, grow much more to the extent that maybe, you know, they need to move to another country, they need to move to another region uh, and, and their partners are not, a, are not really positioned to handle that. So how do you make sure that you can take the good but also you know, protect yourself from any downside or any ceiling that the partnerships or the access to financing you're taking might impose in, in your startup. Yeah, and this is uh, one of the last questions. And the question specifically is around, what's the intersection between women, financial inclusion and uh, climate change in terms of how women can respond to it? 
Um, if anyone has uh, an answer to it, I think just a one liner would be great. Um, as we'd have to wrap up the call in the next five minutes. Uh, in the meantime, um, if there's no answers to that question, we can always get back to it, but there is a question that I wanted to ask to all the panelists. As you guys know, the name of the topic is Making Financial Services Work for Women, Lessons from Founders and Investors. And I'm curious to know what are lessons that you guys have learned from one another during the discussion today. Uh, I learned a bunch of interesting things. I think from Sebastian, it was around embedded uh, finance, from Tofin is understanding that uh, Kenya versus Cameroon are completely different. From Nelly, it was around using women on the ground as your best champion and being able to get go to market without having to invest in that way. And then from Jihan is the potential of SMEs. But I'd love to hear, love to learn from Jihan, for example. What did you learn from your panelists? And then we'll take it from Nelly, Sebastian, Tofin, and then we'll wrap up the call. And feel free to let the audience know what's the best way to stay in touch with you in case they wanna continue the conversation. Um, I think for me, it was also very interesting to learn that Nelly had a very similar um, experience to myself. I think you don't really necessarily understand that until somebody uh, says it to you, because um, it's, it's often that you feel like, you know, you're alone in the journey that you're, you're, you're taking. Um, I think another interesting thing uh, was from uh, Tofene, which is basically that, I guess, looking at the, uh, comparing agricultural uh, processes and, and, and structures to real life. I think that that's honestly very interesting and um, a good perspective to have. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Jihan and Nelly. So I guess uh, it's about like uh, not being afraid of your vision. So thank you, uh, uh, Sebastian, because now I feel very more relaxed. Uh, imagining like what Ijaha could be like since I have like 30 years to build it. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the embedded finance uh, concept really appeals to me towards like achieving like this, imagining like this vision. Uh, one other thing that I really like is like go deep, uh, uh, you know, because like we are building it like, because in Africa, nothing is built. Sometimes you even have to be expert like in, uh, in, in well, in like uh, uh, network, in electricity, because like you don't have electricity all the time, but like going deep and deeper uh, uh, and, fe and feeling like it's normal, like not to really rely on just plugging API, like my uh, other founders in Europe or, or, or America do is, is okay. So yeah, this is what I learned and thank you for that. Awesome, thank you so much for that. And over to you, Sebastian. Certainly, so I mean, for me, it's always incredibly insightful to hear the, the stories of entrepreneurs, particularly as you know, as they've evolved from an idea to you know to to growing and and healthy companies. So, Johan Nelly, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I think being on the other side of the table, I, I um, it certainly makes me think. You know, how can I empower the entrepreneurs that I talk to? How can I leverage? you know, my unique position in the market to really help those entrepreneurs hopefully overcome overcome these barriers. Um, and, and if I may, I, I wanted to maybe just address the, the previous question around climate change. I mean, this is something we we, we truly think about quite a bit. Uh, our perspective is the people that will be most impacted by and in, in are currently most impacted by the impacts of climate change are those that are most vulnerable, unfortunately. So from our unique perspective, focus on financial services, we really think there's a lot of opportunity around resilience and adaptation. So we think financial services are gonna play an, inc an incredibly important role in helping individuals who are impacted by climate change, make sure uh, that minima adapt either to a new reality or make sure that they're not, they, you know, they can be reduced their vulnerab vulnerability. So we, we've done a lot of work here um, in agriculture, for example, where we've seen farmers be impacted, but we wanna make sure uh, that we extend this to other other areas uh, where we also see climate in, uh, climate change being an important negative impact. Thank you so much. And we know we're running up in time. So Tofin, just one line would be great. And then we'll wrap up the call. But uh, there's an active conversation on Twitter. The hashtag is W2023. So feel free to continue the conversation um, offline as well. But over to you. Uh, one last sentence. And then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to thank yeah, our both founders, Nelly, which we, uh, as I said, we, we, we know a little bit, but it's also so different to hear from her. We, we are actually from the same region, but 
we are not that much in contact, to be honest. So I'm very, very happy to rediscover her life and also to Jihan. Super interesting to see what you are facing on the ground. But I just want to re-emphasize that your success also will generate 10 others, uh, each of you. So it's super important that we all end the whole environment to, to be supportive so you, you make it. And yeah, obviously, Action is, uh, you know, one of those uh, pioneers in investing, impact investing. So we are learning a lot from you guys and probably learn almost everything from you. So happy to be, uh, to be also uh, listening to, to, to uh, also to be, to see that we are, we have the same, we are seeing the same trend in the market. Maybe just one last word about climate, just like atmosphere. I'm sorry, for everyone, I'm sorry. we're going to have to really. skip the point on climate um, because time is up. No, no problem. No problem. Thanks no so problem. much uh, for uh, today. Thank you for Women Delivery. Thank you for Axiom for, for putting this together. And like I said, the conversation can still continue on Twitter. Take care and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye, everyone. Thank you.